Value creation is the engine for exchange. Exchange creates wealth. The more we exchange with one another, the more wealth that's created. And a dollar doesn't end because I spend it. You take that dollar. Then you get to use that dollar again, and then someone else uses the dollar. The more times that exchange is hands, the more what we call in economy, velocity happens. Hard work with the wrong philosophy still equals bankruptcy. The rapaciousness and mercenary nature of Wall Street and the things that they do make them impossible. We offer that expertise that does help level the playing field. At the end of the year, I calculate our average gain and I mean, we just do really well. Episode two of Money Revealed. We've got a great lineup for you today. Momentum is building, excitement is building, and I want you to remember you should share this with other people. This free viewing is up right now. Share it with other people that you think can benefit from this information, and let's just dive right into episode two. When I think of our next guest, I think of the term maverick. Garrett Gunderson is a maverick in the financial industry. He wrote a book called Killing Sacred Cows, and let me tell you, he's got some really strong opinions that are at variance with conventional thinking when it comes to your finances and how to invest your finances and how to create a better future for yourself. His energy is inescapable. His brilliance will shine you're going to love this content. It has had a major impact on my life, and now I'm excited because it's going to have a major impact on yours. Enjoy my interview with Garrett Gunderson. Garrett, thanks so much for taking some time out of your day to be with us. Give us a little background on you. Grew up in a small coal mining town. Started my first business when I was 15 years old. Nothing too innovative, just detailing cars. Named it Garrett Gunderson's Car Care. My dad being a coal miner and my mom working in a credit union. Uh, I started detailing the repossessed vehicles, I started cleaning the surface vehicles for the mine, and uh, then I went out and did a business competition. With only $600 in net income in the business, I made $500 for being the rural young entrepreneur of the year, and uh, got pretty fascinated by just conveying messages and teaching, since it was really hard to kind of scrub bugs and tar and buff cars, but uh, yeah, then I ended up winning $5,000 for being the young entrepreneur of the year for the state of Utah. And unlike most teenagers, I actually decided I wanted to invest that money. You know, I want to get out of the, the small little town of Price and hit the big city of Salt Lake City, you know, the <laughs> thriving financial metropolis. And uh, so I went on a path trying to figure out how to invest that money. First time I invested, complete mistake, 18 years old. Because before I was 18, my mom is an Italian, wasn't willing to sign off as a custodian. Their money management method was Folgers coffee cans, put cash in that thing and put it in the cellar, right? <laughs> and just forget about it. Which for a lot of people, that's probably a better money management method than what I've seen. But for me, I wanted to do something bigger. And so when I was 18, I finally made my first investment. They promised me 18% returns. And if I just put a mere $70 a month away, I was gonna be a multimillionaire 40 years from then. And uh, took an econometrics course in college and figured out there was no chance that was gonna happen. And uh, in figuring that out, started asking more questions. And ironically, in asking the questions, got led to being into the financial industry when I was 19 years old, which may sound really cool, but I was just a product peddler. Mm -hmm. I sold life insurance, I sold mutual funds, and my job was just to bring warm bodies into the firm so that they could sell them something while I sat there and so-called learned, but that got me my start. So you say you were a product peddler, um, yeah. but that's kind of masquerades as a financial uh, I said financial I was a financial planner. Okay. <laughs> I said that. I was too embarrassed to admit I was a life insurance salesman at the time. My tie wasn't short enough. My belly wasn't big enough in my <laughs> mind. I mean, I wanted to sound really cool. And the first two years was 98 and 99. I was a genius. I was a financial Einstein in my community because they're cashing out double E bonds and putting in mutual funds and 
everybody made money in those two years. And so they're like, wow, this is great. Until 2000 came around and that started to change. And that's when I began to ask questions. And that's where I got rid of kind of these cliches that indoctrinated my mind, like it takes money to make money, or you're in it for the long haul, or the market's on sale, now's a good time to buy. Well, it was a bad time to buy when most people bought. You know, there's so many memes or kind of philosophies or myths that so many people still adopt because they just don't know any better. It's just what they're trained, taught, and educated to do. And it's unquestioned, even though there's been a massive failure rate, and we've watched this great financial experiment absolutely be decimated, yet people are still taking part in the experiment of buying and holding, setting money aside, hoping that it works out, budgeting to the point where they stop producing value because they're in a restrictive mindset, buying into scarcity, thinking that anyone that's wealthy has done something wrong. I mean, there's so many misnomers that lead people astray, and I think it comes from perspective first, because our perspective determines our action. And if people are in a perspective of scarcity, that there's not enough, and look, let's face it, there's times where when you look at people's environment, where they're born, they're born in a third world country, they're just trying to struggle to get food, they're trying to deal with crazy diseases like maybe ringworm or issues that are coming up, man, that's all they're trying to do is survive. But there's other people that aren't under that same survival circumstance, but their mentality doesn't change. Mm -hmm. And because they're in survival, it becomes a selfish state of existence. That selfish state of existence is, what can I do for me? Neglecting the thought of what can I do for others, and because of that, they stay stuck, they stay poor, or maybe middle class at best, with Herculean effort to say, if I have the right work ethic or I work hard enough, I'll be better off. Hard work with the wrong philosophy still equals bankruptcy. So based on what you're saying, and, and you know, kind of as you're portraying all this, do we have, especially in North America right now, do we have a a crisis as far as people moving toward retirement? Oh, retirement, first of all, it's time to redefine it. Mm -hmm. If we think about retirement, it means to take out of service. And the notion came up from the industrial age where people were working tirelessly, they're dying early because they've worked themselves to death, literally. And now we're thinking, oh, let's retire. And retirement age is 65, and now people are living 30 years past 65 instead of dying at age 60. Mm -hmm. And now they're supposed to live off their investments and Social Security and other programs like that. While they still have the ability to produce, they're not producing anymore, and they actually start to tax society. Mm -hmm. And even worse, the number one fear of a retiree is their fear of running out of money, according to USA Today. Right. So think about this. There's this dream sold to them. One day, someday, you can finally go on these trips. You can finally live the life you've always dreamed of. You could spend time with family. You know, let's dream big about it. And the planners get them thinking about that. Then they're told, yeah, just set your money aside. Scrimp, pinch pennies till you get blisters on your fingers. Mm -hmm. Not knowing that no one shrinks their way to wealth, but they just hand the money over to people they've never met. Because even the fund manager is more a, a different person than the product peddler, right? with stocks that they don't even know what those stocks are, what's happening in those boardrooms, the fees that are coming out of that, why they would make money, why they would lose money. They just kind of go through that process in hopes that one day it's gonna work out. Yet 98% of them, when they turn 65, they're not economically independent. Meaning if they stop working, they don't have enough income coming in from all of their investments and social security or whatever programs are out there to cover their basic expenses. So now what do they do? Especially if they were looking forward to stopping at age 65, they stopped building skills. They stopped moving forward in a growing way. They thought maybe college was their only way to grow. And then afterwards, it's just get a job and work hard, and then one day you'll have a pension that takes care of you. We've watched pensions collapse, partially because they were supposed to earn 8% a year because we've been taught that the stock market's going to earn 8% a year since the year 2000 BC, but the reality is it hasn't done that. And when it doesn't do that, just 1% makes an exponential difference, and all of a sudden they thought they were heading to one destination, they're not even close to that, but at the same time they're ill-equipped, ill-prepared, and unfortunately they haven't been trained on how to produce more cash flow, mm -hmm. how to expand their means to be more productive. They're not thinking in the world of value creation if they're in the retirement mindset. Mm -hmm. They're thinking in the, in the thought process of preservation when they get there, and all that it was supposed to be, it's not but now they're in a scary world and it, you know, it's, it's a really difficult time because it's taxing the system. So here's kind of the ultimate irony here. It seems like a huge contradiction. The big unknown is, when am I gonna die? Right. Nobody knows that. I mean, and that, that's kind of like you're trying to calibrate to this unknown, which is a major variable in this equation.
Completely. So I'm, I'm hearing what you're saying now and I'm starting to add it up in my own mind. Wait a minute, I'm going to retire at a certain age and then I want to have a certain lifestyle beyond that retirement to last me the rest of my life, but we don't know what the rest of your life is, so how do you calibrate to that? So, so suddenly there's people who are trying to act morally, meaning, um, hey, I'm doing the right thing. I'm putting away the money as I'm told to do. Right. I'm putting it it's into the places. Effort. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually one of these people who actually isn't being a mindless you know, consumer that just right. you know, throws caution to the wind. I'm putting the structure in place. I'm delaying gratification because I'm going to do the right thing. But it's all based on a pack of lies. This is the contradiction at the heart of the matter. Everyone's hearing about this term, this phrase, Financial freedom. Right. What is financial freedom? My definition of financial freedom is when money is not the primary reason or excuse why we do or don't do something. Mm -hmm. It's still a consideration, but not the primary consideration. When, when it's someone's primary consideration, they destroy all opportunity. They go, you say, hey, would you like to do this? I can't afford it. That's the mantra. Mm -hmm. I don't have the time. I can't afford it. They're almost kind of cousins. But there's no freedom in that. And yet we think that if there's a certain amount of money in a bank account that that's going to create freedom. That doesn't create freedom because there's people with a lot of money that are just afraid that they're going to lose that money. Or we've seen a situation unprecedented over the last couple of decades. Interest rates have been so low that retirees are not generating the income that they expected. So great. If you're in business right now, you're borrowing money, rates have been great. It, you know, that's awesome for you not such good news for the people that need to create that income because they haven't really been trained in how to produce cash flow. They went their entire life just accumulating net worth and net worth is relatively worthless if it can't be converted to cash. So here's the contradiction. Financial freedom is perfect. That's what's being professed. That's what's being taught. Mm -hmm. But let's examine the reality of that. Mm -hmm. It's actually financial bondage mm -hmm. because we hand our money over, we wait, we get there, and now our entire future is in the hands of a market that we don't control, people that are managing it that we don't know how they manage it, who's even managing it, what the fees are that are coming out, what's going to happen because that dictates our income. And these are the three things that enslave retirees. Number one is interest rates. We've already talked about that. They remain low, your income remains low. Number two, taxes. We have a $20 trillion debt in the United States. How are we going to pay for that? One way might be taxes. If taxes go up when you're on a fixed income, your net income goes down. That means you have to start cutting things out of your life. Mm -hmm. I've met people that were multimillionaires on paper, million dollar paid off home, million and a half in their retirement. They're eating two meals a day mm -hmm. and not because they're intermittent fasting, <laughs> simply because they're afraid if they spend too much and all these trips they had planned, no, nope, they're cutting that back. They're cutting that out. All these relationships they were going to go cultivate and spend time with. You know what? When they're not in control of their money, and when all of a sudden that money starts to infringe upon their relationships because they don't choose to do things in the name of saving money, mm -hmm. and most importantly, they've lost purpose, I think other than poor health, there's nothing that will help someone die faster than losing control of those three things. And the third thing of why they're in financial bondage is inflation. Mm. Inflation has continued to exist. If we went back to the 1980s, we interviewed everyone, hey, what's a good amount of money to have in a retirement plan? We might hear a quarter of a million dollars from most people, mm -hmm. maybe half a million dollars for people that were really kind of out there. And those people that were really forward thinking might say a million dollars. Yet today, that's not going to get you economically independent. Mm -hmm. A million dollars will produce less in today's interest rate environment than the lower end of income earners. So now all of a sudden you're a millionaire on paper, but living like a pauper. That's financial bondage. Financial freedom comes from a completely different place. So this seems to all boil down to the philosophy of money, right? What's your view of reality relative to money? Why do you think that? And then what should you do, right? Those are the three foundational philosophical questions. It has to go all the way back to what we learn in childhood from our mothers, fathers, teachers, preachers, etc. Yep. So you have such context on this because you've made it the study of your life. How do you see it? So money is a tool and it was, it was invented as an efficient way to exchange. But with that efficiency came complexity for people because there are times where people are given something for nothing, uh, slot machines or just enough of a reward or a story of someone that bought a stock and made it big. Mm -hmm. So we have to go to the foundational premise to begin. And that foundational piece is that there's two factions. One faction is people believe there's a finite amount of money mm -hmm. 
So if anyone has more money, that's less for me, mm -hmm. okay? But here's the paradox, and let's go to the other side. Even if there were a finite amount of money, which they're printing it as you watch this, but even if there were a finite amount of money, there's an infinite number of times that money can exchange hands. Mm -hmm. And exchange hands because of goods, services, or experience. And if I said that more simply, it's really a matter of value creation. Mm -hmm. Value creation is the engine for exchange. Mm -hmm. When we stop creating value for one another, and let me get even more raw than this, there's a divinity to diversity, mm -hmm. meaning that we all have different abilities, skills, preferences, talents. If we all could do all the same things, we wouldn't even exchange with one another. But wealth is actually built through unequal exchange. Mm -hmm. So for example, I wrote a book, right? And if I were to sell you that book for $20, you would only give me that $20 if you felt like the book was worth more than $20. I would only sell you that book if I felt like the book was worth less than $20 for me. So we actually could both walk away from that exchange wealthier. But most people don't believe that you could end up wealthier through exchange. They think that it's a win-lose, zero-sum game. So it's a competitive nature. It's a jealous nature. That's where scarcity becomes the rule and entitlement becomes the crux of society. Feeling entitled to something else or feeling jealous. So instead of driving from, what can I do to serve others? What can I do to solve problems? And by the way, the bigger the problem, the bigger the payoff. And if someone in scarcity sees a problem, they usually complain about it, they point it out, they talk about why it's going to ruin their lives or other people's lives, and they get caught up in this really complicated place called the external economy. The external economy, one thought isn't gonna solve that entire thing. One motion isn't gonna solve the entire economy. But what I like to look at instead is our personal economy. We'll have our own personal economy, our own network, our own relationships, our own ideas, and our own actions that we have control over on a day-to-day -day basis. So if instead of getting caught up in the overwhelming nature of everything that's going wrong in the world and complaining about it, we picked one area that we saw more clearly than everyone else, that we had a lesson or an ability to solve that structure or that issue. Mm -hmm. And we were willing to exchange with other people that were fantastic in that. If all of a sudden we started to focus there, instead of just pointing out the problem, coming up with a solution for the problem, there would be more wealth that's created because there would be more exchange that's facilitated. So think of it this way, exchange creates wealth. The more we exchange with one another, the more wealth that's created. And a dollar doesn't end because I spend it, you take that dollar. Then you get to use that dollar again, and then someone else uses the dollar. The more times that exchange is hands, the more what we call in economy, velocity happens. Mm -hmm. So quick economics lesson without you know, getting complicated or putting anyone to sleep, it's just gross domestic product, that's the output of a country, divided by its money supply mm -hmm. equals its velocity. Mm -hmm. So if we want to increase velocity, it's simply with the same amount of dollars, how can we get that to circulate more often amongst each other because we're creating value for one another, doing things that someone else isn't good at. I'm not good at organizing my garage. I found someone that loves it. They're passionate about it. They actually always work extra time there because like, oh, I got a couple more things I want to work on. They love it. I, I once, when I, when I got a review in the New York Post, they were saying, you know, Gunderson's book talks about people doing things that they enjoy, but there's plenty of work that no one enjoys. And we see programs like Dirty Jobs and all this kind of stuff. And I, I kind of thought about that for a minute. And then I met a guy from Brigham City, Utah, who ran a sewage treatment plant, and it was the, he loved it, he was lit up by it. So there are sick enough people to you know, love the things that we hate. And I think this is how we, we redefine retirement. We retire from the things that we hate and embrace the things that we're very best at. And rather than thinking it takes money to make money and use that as a defeating declaration, like, oh, I don't have money, I'm never gonna make money. It doesn't take money to make money, it takes value. It takes two other forms of capital. Mm -hmm. Mental capital, which is our ideas, our knowledge, our wisdom, mm -hmm. its systems, its tools, it's our unique insights. Times relationship capital, people, networks, organizations, mentors, family, friends, and all we're doing, business is just the bridge between those two things. Our mental capital or ideas to relationship capital. So how can our ideas impact someone's life for the positive? Mm -hmm. So anyone that thinks they have a money problem, that's just a symptom. That's a symptom of the problem. Money's the receipt, it's on the other side of the equation. It's a byproduct. What drives money is mental and relationship capital. So you're one idea or one relationship away 
from the next dollar that you make or the next level of prosperity that you can have. And if we could focus on that, what do we bring to the world versus what does the world owe us? What can we do to contribute right now, even if we have no dollars in our pocket? I mean, I started my very first job that I ever had was a dump site where they were doing a grand opening. It was 105 degrees and we had to drive these, these nails into a tent that was in rock that took us forever with sledgehammers. But it got me some money. Before that, I, I remember pulling weeds for Mrs. Oliveto. I got paid, I think, $2 for the entire day. But it just taught me, I wanna do something different. What else can I do that's better? And I really realized that in the old days, we were paid for our brawn. Mm -hmm. Maybe or for being part of the Lucky Sperm Club and you were born into royalty. And sure, there was a lot more of that back then than there is now. Mm -hmm. But I've met kids that aren't even teenagers yet that are worth a million dollars, not because they inherited money, not because they came from money, but because of the advent of the internet. Uh, I met someone recently that he hosts and puts on these huge conventions for Minecraft and Lego. That started because his daughter wanted to film YouTube videos. One of our mutual friends, his son had a $590,000 revenue at 16 years old, starting a business with less than $1,000. The problem is most people don't even know that this is a possibility. They don't recognize this exists because they're confused about money. And they wake up with the wrong question in their mind. How can I make more money? How can I make more money? may tend to move you towards some level of action, but a more powerful question would be, what issues are there in the world that I could solve? What actions can I take to contribute? What ways do I feel engaged and compelled to do something? And sometimes you do that without financial reward. You just contribute to someone because as you become a contributor and you're thinking about value creation, you leave scarcity and embrace abundance in something I call the producer paradigm where you finally seek to create more value in the world than you take from it. People that are poor, they're in survival, so they're not necessarily thinking about contributing more to the world than they take, they're thinking about just making it another day. Mm -hmm. That's a mindset. People stay in the survival mindset that don't even have to stay there, and they unfortunately get stuck in the consumer condition where they look to extract more from the world than they give, and that is never an equation for wealth or exchange, and it's why they start to have envy, frustration, anger and spend more time complaining than doing. So it sounds very much like the entrepreneurial disposition um, about saying, hey, let me figure out a way to add value and, and create income to myself as a result of adding value. Now let's maybe look at the person who has a job, right? decent job, but it's steady paycheck based on you know, fixed amount of uh, working hours that they do that can be characterized maybe as a career for a lot of people. How should they be thinking about this? As an intrapreneur. What's an intrapreneur? An intrapreneur is someone that works inside of an organization. But what they do is they abandon this time and effort industrial age economy where you just punch a clock, you show up, and you trade time for dollars. Mm -hmm. And instead, they start considering how they contribute to the bottom line of the organization. And rather than being an owner, because ownership a lot of times means Hey, if you're sued, now you're involved in that lawsuit. Hey, if you need to add a capital call because they're short on cash that month, you've got to infuse cash. Mm -hmm. If all of a sudden things are tight, you're not taking your paycheck. There's not a lot of people that have kind of the desire to do that. And so they can be entrepreneurial where they say, I'd like to have more upside potential. Mm -hmm. If I can contribute more to this firm, if I can contribute and understand how I direct and improve the bottom line, I'd like to have a little piece of that. Mm -hmm. So now they're part of a community, they're part of a culture, they're part of an organization where they could thrive. See, some people that are more engineering minded and methodical don't love starting a business because they think of all the number of things that most business owners, we have enough you know, ignorance and arrogance to just plow through and then we deal with it when it comes up. They're pretty smart to see that ahead of time. A lot of times they can thrive within an organization. Um, and I really feel like we're in this economy right now where it doesn't take massive amounts of money to start a business. There's so many people that have side hustles, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I have people I know that they rented out two rooms in their house through Airbnb and that started cash flowing and they bought their first real estate property that was for a rental. Mm -hmm. I know other people that said, hey, I have good artistic you know, qualities, so I'm gonna go and put my services on different online platforms and all of a sudden they're getting clients and they, they do that work, graphic work at night, right? So there's so many things and platforms that great entrepreneurs have brought to us 
that an entrepreneur or someone that doesn't have the stomach to just take all that responsibility on themselves can now participate in to increase their income. Because all the financial books in the world try to get you to save, sacrifice, delay, defer, budget, and that just takes extraordinary amounts of discipline and energy. Mm -hmm. And if we're in shrinking-based thinking that's about restriction instead of production, that is a harmful place to be. Instead, I'd like people to think about how they can expand their means, because we've all heard to live within our means, which usually thinks, uh, let's have life suck. Let's cut out good things that we enjoy. And you know what? After meeting you, I just enjoy finer things in life. Uh, my dad showed me boxed wine when I was young. You showed me bottled wine and uh, not only just any bottles, you know, and then you showed me dark chocolate. My, I grew up on milk chocolate. All of a sudden, those things, a luxury once enjoyed becomes a necessity. But the key is, yes, it's important to live within your means, but continually seek to expand your means. Because if I'm telling you to pinch pennies to save 10% of your income, and then try to get through Herculean efforts, once again, 10% return, which is really hard to get for the majority of people in today's world that don't own a business, that's 10% of 10%. But if instead we figured out, what are your best qualities? What are the things and skills and abilities you have that you could cultivate and grow and then you invest back into yourself. It doesn't show up on a piece of paper initially and that's the tough thing. When I put money in an investment like a mutual fund or a savings account or a certificate of deposit, I get a statement. When I invest into my own skills, my own abilities, I'm now relying more on myself, which can be a scary thing. But at the same time, it's gonna take a little bit longer to pay off. But if it does, imagine if I increase my income by 25%. That's 25% of 100%. Mm -hmm. Expanding our means is so critical, and as soon as we forget to do that, or we start shrinking because retirement's around the corner, or we stop thinking about enhancing our skills, we are in a disruptive time and place. Before, you could have the same skill for 20, 30 years. Now there's people that maybe learned to drive, but now there's driverless vehicles coming out. They're gonna have to have a new set of skills, and this is the toughest part. The toughest part and the crux of society comes down to this thing right here that if we are dependent upon an income and that is what's going to put food on the table or take care of our family, it is super difficult to make decisions that are the right decisions in the long term due to that scarce feeling in the short term. As a matter of fact, to go deeper in this, mm -hmm. this is why great and even good people do bad things mm -hmm. because they're so concerned about their family, which is noble, but at the same time, they don't see the, the outcomes and what they're creating in the world that could be destructive, and they don't want to question it because it could jeopardize the very nature of their income. What I want to see is people liberated where they create economic independence as their foundational piece. Get there in three years or seven years, not wait for 30 years. Have enough cash flow coming in that they have choice. They have options. They have an inkling of what that freedom feels like and now they can make more powerful choices, swing for the fences in what they're up to, choose not to do something if it's not ethical or moral for themselves, or if they see something that excites them, they have a permission slip to go for it. You wrote a New York Times bestselling book, Killing Sacred Cows, and yeah. it created quite a stir, quite a controversy. What's the theme of the book? That there's nine really subtle financial myths or financial lies that are super hard to detect. Mm. The reason they're difficult to detect is because we look through the lens of the myth. We look through the lens of the lie, and there's a lot of marketing to support that. Mm -hmm. So if we continue to follow these things, the first one is the myth of the finite pie. That there's only so much to go around, and if someone else has something, there's less for us. And we can go hundreds of years back, and Thomas Malthus would say, we're going to run out of food. We're going to run out of land.